Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of the Robert Sylvester Kelly Chicago trial and the federal Brooklyn trial appeal. So we are going to talk today about uh, some information that has just come out. Some, you know, how Robert is doing. Um, this is legal terminology coming from the mouth of his attorney. So you're going to get a in-depth understanding of his health, what's going on, what the advantages are for prosecution in their opening arguments, and then their testimony of Jane. And we're going to talk more about what we need to do to prepare to apply for an appeal. So that's what tonight's topic is all about. I want you to listen to this clip, very phenomenal clip. This was during the time after the first day of deliberations and, you know, uh, you know, trying to pick the jury to make sure that everybody was going to be on one accord legally. So we won't have to go through a process of an appeal um, or a rebuttal to what is being sidebarred like it was in the federal Brooklyn trial. So let's listen and then we're going to discuss a little bit about what we should be focused on here. All right, here we go. This is the interview with Jennifer Bonjean, and she's going to introduce her. Sure, no problem. Thank you for her partnership. Thank you, Kansas, for giving this information to us to reveal. Being there at the actual Chicago. So, do you want me to make a little statement, and we can follow up? Okay. Yeah, sure. My name is Jennifer Bonjean. I'm with my colleagues, uh, Attorney Ashley Cohen and Attorney Diane O'Connell. My law firm is the Bonjean Law Group, and we, we represent R. Kelly, Robert S. Kelly. And today we had our first day of jury selection. For any of you who were in the courtroom, you could see um, it's rather difficult to find people who have not received information, heard information about R. Kelly, um, and that really presents a challenge for us to try to get fair and impartial jurors um, because it's not just a matter of people wanting to be fair and believing they can be fair. It's whether you're capable of being fair and non-biased given what you've heard and what's in your brain and whether you can actually listen to the evidence that comes from the witness stand untainted by the lens that you may be looking through it with because you've had so much exposure to pretrial publicity or in this case a very very popular uh, documentary surviving r kelly which i think um is 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 presenting a problem and will continue to present a problem so um that is that is our primary focus right now is trying to get that fair jury we we're well through the process. Can you talk a little bit more about that docu-series? You asked the judge essentially to strike anybody who'd seen any part of it. He didn't agree with that, but why did you ask that? And because there are rare circumstances in the law, Seventh Circuit acknowledges it, where we say, that the courts say, that a juror is presumed bias, no matter what he or she says. And that doesn't mean because they're lying or because they are being misleading purposely. It's just that there is too great a risk there's too great a risk that a juror would not be able to listen to the evidence coming through into the courtroom without considering matters that they've heard outside the courtroom. If someone has seen Ivan R. Kelly, which, by the way, includes testimonials and interviews with people who are going to take the stand, as a matter of common sense, I'm sure there's been plenty of studies done on it, it would be so difficult, it would be impossible. I hear 
what did I hear during the documentary versus what am I hearing now and type of impression at the time you saw this person speak on TV, which by the way, they would not have been subject to any cross-examination. They would not have had their story challenged in any way. Now they're hitting the stand. So I think it's impossible. I think this is a rare case where bias, a rare case where bias must be presumed. And that is why I asked the court to strike any potential juror who, who had seen the documentary, any portion of the documentary. He did not agree. Um, and uh, as a result, um, it may be the case that we have no choice, uh, that we will have jurors on, on our jury that have seen it. And that now, responding to this, this question, but the bottom line is, what do you think this is going to mean for your client? So many people have seen that documentary and know about the Yeah, I mean... Uh, it's not just that there were people that came with the information about the New York case. They then announced it in a courtroom for anybody who hadn't heard about it now does know about it. So um, our position is we have a tainted jury pool. We, um, we, we start with a tainted jury pool to some degree. In any high-profile case, there is that potential. Uh, but there are these unique cases in history um, Shepard versus Maxwell is a United States Supreme Court uh, case that goes way back. Um, so there are these unique cases, and uh, this is going to be one of them, uh, that uh, we, we aren't going to get what the Constitution demands, which is a fair and impartial jury, but at least there is that risk that we will not get that because of the pretrial publicity that they've been exposed to. Again, um, and I want to make this very clear, this is not even a matter of people being bad or being untruthful or, or misleading. It's just you people have an instinct to want to believe they can be fair no matter what they've heard. I'm a fair person, uh, but we are human beings and there is um, bias that we're not always in touch with it. And it's not something you can predict uh, until you're in the middle of the trial when it's too late. Um, oh, I remember that girl. She testified or, or gave an interview in, this, in the Surviving R. Kelly series. I really liked her. What, you know, it, it's something along those lines, those bell thing that we should be guarding against. But, um, again, uh, I have great respect for Judge Lina Weber. He disagreed with our position on that. But we've made our record, and that's all we can do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, so as a general proposition, um, you know, juries aren't supposed to know about prior convictions or prior bad acts unless someone takes the stand. And of course, Mr. Kelly may still testify, but um, they are privy to information that they otherwise would not have been privy to. And that's negative information. The fact that he's previously been, been convicted in another jurisdiction is, is a, a data point that this, this jury is, members of this jury are going to have knowledge about. Um, and how can we be assured that they will not take that into account when assessing the evidence in this case? I don't know that we can. So um, I think we start off in a really bad place because of that. Uh, but again, we are going to continue to fight and hope that this jury follows the law and will do their best to put that stuff aside. But it is not an enviable position and it puts the government at a significant advantage. Uh, so uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> how's Robert? He seems engaged in the process. He is. Um, he is engaged in the process. Uh, it, he said it was much better than the New York case because um, in New York they were actually doing physical sidebars and he really wasn't able to participate to the degree he would have liked to. And really jury selection is one of those things where the client should be, part, be the most uh, active. It's a jury of his peers that he is choosing. Um, and I feel very strongly that he should be part of that. And he is. He can hear what's going on. He's obviously being privy to our conversations, we're, we're chatting, um, and we're talking about um, the process, and I am glad he's able to participate. As you know, he has significant literacy issues, so he it's difficult for him to quickly read a questionnaire, um, so a lot of it has to be orally expl you know, um, explained to him. It slows the process down a little bit, um, but we're making through. We're making through, making it through. How, how is his health? What, three years since I saw him here in Chicago yeah. before he was arrested. He looks like he's aged quite a bit and he put on some weight. Yeah, it, it, life is hard in uh, prison and jail. Um, 
the medical care is not great. Um, he has, um, he does have medical issues. Um, I think it's a matter of public record. Um, certainly, a sentencing. Um, he's diabetic. He has, um, he has an anxiety disorder. Um, he was assaulted in Chicago um, at the MCC. Um, you know, so he he has he has significant challenges. It's very stressful. Um, I I mean, you know. His information was stolen by a BOP officer. Um, his email, um, I, I, it was reported on, but a BOP officer hacked into um, the, not hacked into, I, I, that is not even accurate, actually accessed with her credentials um, and gained access to his personal information, his phone calls. So, and, and this is, is really difficult to be able to be in custody um, not knowing whether any of your privacy rights are being honored. Um, that's stressful. Um, it's hard to, I mean, you know, whatever your feelings are about him, he is entitled to be able to communicate with his lawyers free of fear that it's going to be um, recorded, um, uh, free of uh, fear that information will be stolen and, and sold or shared with YouTube bloggers. Um, so... Uh, you know, it is, he has unique challenges in custody that other people don't, and it has not been easy, and, it, and his health is not great. Thank you. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. Uh, you think you opening statements on Wednesday? I, I, so that I'm would be my best guess. for that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank Although you. Wow. So, we're hearing firsthand out of the mouth of, you know, Robert's attorney that what is going on is making it a lot difficult for him, more difficult. But again, the appeal, I'm telling you, there are so many things happening on purpose. It has to be to allow prosecution the opportunity to express and witnesses and victims to express. Now we've heard phenomenal information from transcripts. I don't read transcripts, but if you go online and you listen to some of the reports that are written on transcripts and all that, um, it's very, very, it's, it's very heavy. It's very heavy. Um, so you would have to mentally be prepared for that. Um, that's why they don't allow everybody publicly into the process of the deliberations because a lot of the information they don't even understand even broken down into layman terms so what i do here is i'm going to be granting um granted the motion reading as far as the actual things that are put on the docket that's all i'm doing the docket review from um motions filed specifically um, so we will keep you posted on the intricate workings of what's going on day to day and just public information so it won't overwhelm you. But I just, I'm so grateful that Bonjean came and made that press release for us to understand what's going on beyond the transcripts and all of the motions and the filings of the legal terminology she was able to really, really get us connected to what Robert is going through. Her and Robert and her law group. I mean, everyone, they're in there with the demons themselves, literally, literally. And then you have access to, I did, um, one of my students had given me information about some of the transcript readings. They're doing that in at the university, but the transcript reading that they pre presented to me is that there are tapes and a tape is missing. There is, you know, again, that immunity question, and that's where they are. They're looking at the immunity process behind this as a university to see if his rights are being violated. So that is something that we're going to continue to look into and just keep our minds set there for if there is a need of an appeal. 
We're not even talking about how the jury was selected and picked and chosen, even though they have tremendous amount of information that could create their bias. As Bonjean says, I don't need to go over what she's already just stated. But I mean, that's a very big situation there. I mean, we heard that R is dealing with issues relating to his health. And, you know, I know and I pray that he is giving, he is being given the best opportunity. And I know how it is when all of a sudden you, you're on the street and cause this happened to me, you're on the street, healthy, everything is fine. You go into the incarcerated state all of a sudden now you have all type of high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have all this other crazy stuff that you never had out here. And it's because of the way that you're eating. Of course, if all you have on commissary is, you know, um, potassium or that type of the potatoes and, you know, all of the things that will pick up your weight, then of course you're not going to be eating healthy. You're not eating rare you're not eating the top of the line sirloin tip steak dinners anymore you're down to the basic bare minimum of potato chips for dinner making breaks with noodles i mean we understand what's happening there so of course he's going to be going through a lot of weight gain and of course he's going to be stressed it's post-traumatic stress disorder just being incarcerated in and of itself i know this I, I know it firsthand, but it's the positive energy that you create from knowing that you have a great team that is going to support you and um, help you see what's going on. Like she says, she takes her time and she explains to Robert what's going on. You know, she takes the time to update him. She takes the time to make him aware of what is taking place in the court situation. It may take some time. Yes. But I'd rather him, I'd rather the time be taken and Lennon Weber allow that time to be taken than to not be able to explain to him what's going on so he can be a part of his own trial. And as you see, that's what he said. He was not able to participate in his own trial in federal Brooklyn case. You know, so with these exams and with these opening statements and with these jury selections, I'm putting this on the docket for my students. Um, the event that I received as far as the documentation for the essay that was provided um, last for the assignment last week, someone made the remark, someone created a four page essay about the discriminatory practices with the United States government and how that should be implemented into the criminal justice system law regarding defendants, testimonies, and allowing and uh, the allowance of what sidebars will be put into practice. So there needs to be a law, and this is something that we're gonna talk about in coursework on the private um, platform. We are gonna talk about the different processes sidebars must have precedence under in order to prevent judges from even being able to take the uh, legal power that they hold within their own discrimination to shut down a defense. And that is a very good topic. I think that topic was is, is phenomenal. I think that is 21st century thinking. I really, really, you know, appreciate Miss Barquer, I appreciate what you submitted out to me because, you know, it is something that we should be considering right now in the legalities 
of how much are we going to allow the judges the opportunity because we're all human, including the judge. And if he's biased already to defense, it's going to make it very difficult for defense to prove their point while prosecution has all access to every inalienable right under the Constitution. But yet defense does not. So Ms. Barquer, I give you that whole 45. I get you, I give you that whole 45 credit because it was a phenomenal how you broke that down just by looking at, and this is what I want all my students to pay attention to my interns. I need you to understand when you look at law, when you're practicing in a law group somewhere that is biased against the concept behind allowing the defense to have their fair day at trial and in court, whether it's civil or criminal, we need to be extremely mindful to document that. And when it hits second circuit, seventh circuit, when it goes all the way to Supreme Court, then at that time we need to put it on the docket, formulate that docket. And this is what should have been happening in the federal Brooklyn trial, but people were becoming so motivated by sovereignty until they felt that they needed to have the right to tell this judge this or that. But in the criminal process, there is a decency and an ordered way of doing what they do. Now, mind you, prosecution is doing whatever they want to do. That's not our problem. Our issue is making sure that we are available to the docket when it's time to file as a concerned person, such as how Me Too movement started. We can now create a format that puts judges at accountability through the criminal justice system's rules and guidelines. Instead of having a way to go to appeal, there needs to be some formulation, some form of movement that persuades motions to be documented at the exact time things are happening. And this is why Bon Jean takes the emotions very seriously. When she files her motion, she does that to protect Robert for any aftermath. So some people feel that she makes her motions extremely slow. Well, it happens when it needs a motion needs to be filed when the act, the actual act of prosecution discrimination begins. And so the Bar Association, they need to recognize this. And this is what who we're speaking to, American Bar Association. Legal um, rights for defendants in America, that system. We are also speaking to the NAACP because someone needs to come in and you know, go beyond, instead of just waiting for something to come to where it looks like he's going to win, then you jump in and say, I'm here to support. No, we have to go through the motions step by step for it to be truly moral, for it to be truly genuine and moral. So as far as Lisa Van Allen and as far as, you know, Jane, Jane and her family, all of the immunity, there's a reason why immunity was taking place in the beginning. And the very reason why is because prosecution is trying to hide a lot of things that had they allowed in to cross-examine and to unsidebar, we would be dealing with a lot more incarceration than just Robert Sylvester Kelly, Daryl McDavid, and Milton Brown. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the motions from what I'm seeing on the docket and the information I'm getting firsthand is literally saying, saying that McDavid and Brown is just sitting there like puppets on a string. Their attorneys are talking for them on their behalf, but in a lot of this, they're just sitting on the sidelines waiting for their part of it. So Bonjean, I think, is doing a wonderful job. I'm so grateful for her. I'm grateful for the Bonjean Law Group, and they are looking beautiful. 
I mean, they looking, they're doing their thing. And I'm so happy because these women are going to, and, and Judge Joe Brown mentioned it when he looked at them from the position of the federal Brooklyn trial. He said, those are the women that are going to be powerful move, move, movement shakers to awaken at least not seeing a black man's face, but seeing their grandmother, seeing their aunt, seeing their sister, seeing their people, their church members, their nuns. And you know what I mean? Bonjean looks like all of those. And it's good that she is on his side. She's not afraid of Robert. She's not afraid of what people say. She's very strong. She's very intelligent. She's very connected to the criminal justice system in a way that goes beyond the basis. She saw that the criminal justice system at one way will not sustain you unless you go through the appellate process. And it's amazing because when I, when I went to law I wanted to go to Emory Law School in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, and when I signed my agreement to, you know, put my application in there and I got my transcript sent out, it was amazing because I found out that I was pregnant with my second child. So I was unable to do that because I didn't want to move with the stress and going to college in a new place. So I ended up going to my local university here. And what I did find is that as I'm going through pre-law, being the only African-American female in the entire middle class classroom of political science, I realized what these people were saying about our culture. And if you're not in the middle and the midst of this stuff, you will never believe what is being spoken openly about a culture that no one knows anything about just from what they heard their parents say or what social media shows. They didn't see that I was a struggling African-American new parent with, you know, uh, um, a baby, you know, getting ready to give birth September 15th, but having to sit back 15 days later and go in there and take that final exam in order to pass this you know, it looked as though it was a prejudicial act upon me, but I refused to see it that way. And I said, no weapon form is going to stop me from gaining what I know I need to do because I'm greater than this. No adversity is going to stop me. I'm going to graduate in 2000 with my bachelor's degree. And I did. I walked across that stage, winter 2000. So I say to Jennifer Bonjean, I know the struggle that you're facing. I mean, I know all the nights that you put into making sure that these appellate laws are being honored because a law can be on the books all day. But if nobody knows how to go and research it to find the law, to compare the law to the law, then these individuals are going through the pipeline. And believe me, you, if it was not Robert Sylvester Kelly, Imagine the individuals that are sitting there going through what we see happening in the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly to a normal everyday average Joe Blow who was an innocent man and because he was there or she was there or whatever, they are now incarcerated and no one's really taking their case seriously. Because if you remember, I just talked about the Supreme Court and how they have that choice to decide what cases they choose to take. And you got to keep going. So that appellate process, that appeal process is extremely important because at the base level, you have individuals who are able to be paid off. Did you hear what Bonjean stated when she said that individuals were hacking in? No, not hacking in, using their actual credentials to go within and find information and leak it and give it away. It's the loyalty the morality and the ethical principles of people based on the purpose of why they chose to go into law. For me, I wanted to go to Emory Law School for civil rights law 
because I knew that the civil rights of individuals were being miscalculated. It wasn't being treated in fairness. So I understand where you are, Jennifer. I know the nights, I know the exams. I know how much cramming you are doing in order just to look good and go sit at the hairdresser and spend an hour getting your hair flat ironed just to put on the suit because you've been studying all this stuff all day trying to figure out, getting phone calls from Robert and hearing what's going on in there and, and trying to persuade it over so people could understand that we just want a fair and equal trial. We don't want this information that is so outdated until it does not even matter anymore. This woman is an adult. She obviously have lived her life to the degree where she has made it through. 37 years old, you are basically, you're a pro at experience. So you've made it through. Lisa Van Allen, you've made it through. You are no longer getting told to sit in a room until he comes in and strip butt naked and go get in a jacuzzi and wait for him. You're no longer there. Andrea, you are no longer sitting in the back of the tour bus reading your Bible. Get into the 21st century, people, because these prosecutors and the government in which we are watching take precedence over Robert Cervelli, Sylvester Kelly's case is literally saying, I want you to stay stuck in this mentality, this mentality so we can have some new laws on the book so that you can, you know, be looked at as having immunity. So being separate, but equal, separate, but equal and a victim at the same time. You will go down in history, ladies, as being a victim because you did not choose to stand up and do anything to make yourself greater than what the expectation would have been had you had Robert made you number one. It's really sad. And this is why I tell my young ladies, even in my internship, I don't care how old or how young you are, don't depend on a man to make the decisions for you in your life. If I depended on a man right now, I wouldn't be bringing you these presentations every day because he would be taking away my time. He would be investing, oh, he would be jealous of Rob right now, even if I'm just here getting information out. He would be angry, he would be obsessed. Oh, you love Rob more than you love me because you always on it. You see what I'm saying? And so the mentality is know what you know. And no matter what you go through in this life, know why you're doing it. Know who you are. Know why you hold the title as a doctorate in international business. This is what I do. This is what I do on a regular basis. This is what I do in, when it comes down to business development. This thing is serious. You got to know the laws even in putting together a mom and pop store. You better have a portfolio. You better have that business insurance. You better have that documentation that you need from the, se from the secretary of your state. You better know what you know. And you better not give up because the second you give up is the moment that things change, including laws. But one thing about law that always stays the same. And I'm about to get off of here in a little bit. The very one, number one thing of law that stays the same is morals, values, and ethical principles and standards. That's what stays the same. I thank you, wise intelligent, for keeping me focused. I thank you, Mila. I thank you, Jolitha. I thank you, Blue Bunny Gamer Girl. I thank you, Timothy Flowers. I thank you, April Showers. My grandson made a big joke about that. <laughs> Timothy Flowers, April Showers. <laughs> he, he, he told me to make a joke about it and, and put it out there for something really cool because it matches. You know, um, there's a lot. There's a lot, you know. I'm grateful for um, Shiloh. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Stephanie, 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so supportive in where we're going with this thing. You know, Southern Belle, you know you always in the house, my 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 dear friend. Frankie and Johnny, you're continually being supportive. You know, I thank you for all that you put forth in comments and content and even information. Queen B in the house. Queen B looking out, you know. Carla, Linda, Klima. I remember I knew a girl, her name was Dreama. Dreama, I just thought about you. I give a shout out to you because that name is so, so cool, you know. Um, I also want to sit back and give a shout out to Jason, Jason, you know who you are, Linda, the other Linda, Claudette, Sophia, yes, you know, these are the people who make the R. Kelly Appeal TV move, you know, or the ones that at least stand up and say, I'm here, I'm present. I'm not just listening to your information just for whatever. Alma, crazy bother. Yes. You know, Elvira. And many, 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 many more. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought I was going to have a problem, you know, going from live to premiere um, but it's not a problem. It's it's a sheer blessing. And I'm so grateful for all of you, um, even those who are in the background listening and watching and just observing me, growing to know me. I give a shout out to you because you make the R. Kelly Appeal TV what it is. So with that, continue to be a blessing to someone. When you see injustice happening, please speak up on it. You know, you may not have to say, hey, I see injustice happening there. No, document it. And when the time comes and the spirit will let you know when that time is, use it to the advantage of everyone. And it don't take a whole hour to talk. This is what I love about premieres. For me, it seems like the lives always take a lot longer, but I'm going to stop at 37 minutes. I think you have enough to meditate on and to comment and put your energy into the discussion and the conversation. We will always keep you informed. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. You are valued. Please continue to keep coming back. And with that, always keep it 100 and we will see you next time.